Welcome to yet another edition of COVID-19. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today, June 25th, marks the 70th anniversary of the Korean War and much has changed since then as South Korea has transformed itself from a war-torn country into one that is currently leading a war against a global pandemic. We have more later on in the program, but here first are the headlines for this Thursday with our Kwon Soa and Noara. Hi. So I understand we're seeing a drop in the number of cases here in Korea. Yes, compared to yesterday's surge that we had, the figures do look much more promising today. Uh, as for the first time in three days, we have less than 30 new infections. So for a closer look, we have 28 new cases, which raises the total caseload in Korea to 12,563. And one more person died of the virus, bringing the death toll to 282, while 1,300 107 people are still in quarantine and 10,974 people have fully recovered and that brings the recovery rate to a little below 90 percent, 87.4 percent to be exact. Now uh, we have 23 less cases than yesterday, but uh, if we do take a look at the past seven days, uh, you'll notice how many ups and downs we have been experiencing. So we've been between the 30s and 50s on average. So the fluctuating, the fluctuating trend is expected to continue for a while. Right, so I understand officials are linking today's drop to a lower number of imported cases. Right, uh, the majority of today's cases were locally transmitted cases, and to be exact, 23 were local transmissions. In the metropolitan region, eight were reported in Seoul, nine in Gyeonggi-do province, one in Incheon. There were also four new cases in Daejeon and one in Chungcheong Namdo province. Now, cluster infections at door-to-door -door sales establishments account for a large proportion of new cases, with those linked to door-to-door -to -door marketing company Richway still added on a daily basis. 205 total cases have been confirmed as of Wednesday. A similar group infection traced to such establishment in Daejeon resulted in 58 total cases. And as has been the trend in recent weeks, small gatherings are found to be especially prone to infections. Health authorities confirmed Wednesday that five coronavirus cases were confirmed to have occurred during a social club meeting of car enthusiasts at a parking lot near Han River last week. And what's also notable is already one of those cases was a secondary infection, again showing how the virus does not discriminate locations and also spreads fast. And speaking of spreading, how is the virus spreading overseas? Well, things are not really looking good overseas uh, when it comes to the rising numbers. Let's take a look at the total number of infections first. We have now more than 9.5 million cases and uh, 485,000 fatalities and uh, 172,000 new cases were added on Wednesday alone. And uh, for a closer look, the U.S. has over 2.46 million cases and 38,000 new cases were added just uh, in a day and Brazil now has almost 1.2 million cases while Russia surpassed the 600,000 mark and India added some 16,000 new cases bringing the total to 472,985 uh, and moving over to other regions uh, we have uh, Iran now almost having a death toll of nearly 10,000 and uh, significant here on this list uh, Mexico in a day uh, Mexico became the country with the 11th highest number of infections yesterday. It already uh, became the country with the 12th highest number. Now, meanwhile, concerns are mounting in the U.S. where nationwide infections appear to be back to the peak level uh, that we saw back in April, with some states seeing the highest number of daily cases and hospitalizations, particularly in the South and West. Reports on a Wednesday local time said Florida broke a daily record with more than 5,500 new infections and rapid infections in the younger age group is another worrisome factor. Uh, these trends have prompted states that are recovering from the virus to impose new travel measures, including New York, once the country's hotspot, which will require uh, some out-of-state visitors to isolate themselves for 14 days. 
And speaking of travel measures, there are countries that are choosing to lift their travel restrictions and others are choosing to impose new restrictions. Exactly. Um, first off, the United Arab Emirates has lifted its COVID-19 curfew. The UAE's government announced that everyone will now be allowed to freely enter and exit the country throughout the day. Residents had to follow a 90-day curb under the UAE's national sterilization program, which among other restrictions called on people to stay home between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. in Dubai and 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. in all other Emirates. Meanwhile, over in Europe, Austria implemented a partial travel ban for Germany's state of North Rhine-Westphalia, recommending residents to refrain from non-essential travel to that region. And that's due to a cluster infection at a meat factory there, with Austria's authorities highlighting how fast another dramatic situation can unfold. Okay, so I thank you for that. Do stay with, with us for more on the domestic updates after the regular briefing. Will do. And Adam, quite a gloomy outlook coming out from the global health body. That's right. The uh, WHO's uh, chief says he expects the number of cases around the world to reach 10 million within the next week. Here he was speaking on the urgency of stemming this further spread. This is a sober reminder that even as we continue research into vaccines and therapeutics, we have an urgent responsibility to do everything we can with the tools we have now to suppress transmission and save lives. Remarks, uh, now, he also noted that in the last month, almost 4 million cases have emerged. By contrast, he said less than 10,000 cases were reported uh, in the first month of the outbreak. So that's quite a difference. Now, the Americas, as we saw, uh, are the worst hit globally. And the WHO warns that the pandemic there has not actually reached its peak yet. And many countries in the region have experienced 25 to 50 percent increases in cases just in the last week alone. Meanwhile, back here in Korea, there are some new guidelines related to quarantine. That's right. So health authorities have decided to lower the bar for releasing coronavirus patients from quarantine. Now, starting today, asymptomatic patients can be released from quarantine if they show no symptoms for 10 days, even if a second test comes out positive. Now, previously, isolation ended only when the patients turned two negative test results 24 hours apart on the seventh day after COVID-19 diagnosis. Now, under the changes, many patients are expected to be released faster than before, of course, in order to make more beds available for those in a more serious condition. And because of the shortage of beds, quarantine decisions will now be based more on symptoms rather than testing, which often yields a positive result, uh, even when the patient is not uh, that contagious. I see. And Adam, moving over to Brazil, the country's top football league is in doubt. That's right. Some disappointing news in Brazil. We know how much they love football over there. But uh, nearly 100 players in the Serie A league have tested positive for COVID-19. It is the second worst hit country in the world, as we saw in the numbers earlier. Now, that number may increase as two clubs are yet to announce their test results. Uh, prominent club Corinthians have the most cases with 21 players infected, followed by Vasco da Gama with 19. Now, the Brazilian uh, football governing body is mulling whether to resume the top flight league amid the virus concerns. Regional leagues have been suspended since mid-March, apart from a few, including in uh, Rio de Janeiro. However, a few clubs there have been opposing the league's resumption of, and have uh, even taken some legal action as well over the resumption. Now, other local leagues are not seeking to resume their respective uh, leagues, but Brazil's president has said that he does want to see football leagues resume in the country. Uh, he thinks it will give the people a relief from virus-related uh, stress and also help reduce movement of people because uh, they'll be staying at home watching TV more often. I see. All right, Aram, thank you for that. We'll see you again tomorrow. See you tomorrow. It's time now for the regular government briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea. The number of infections for this Thursday stands below 30, but health authorities are calling for much caution as the numbers have been fluctuating, as our Kwon Soha has mentioned in recent days. Officials are tackling not only sporadic cluster infections in the metropolitan region, since they eased stringent social distancing guidelines on May 6th, but also a surge in import cases of the virus. Now, cluster infections continue here, and most cases have been traced to logistics centers, door-to-door -door retailers, and small churches. In fact, cases linked to a door-to-door -door sales establishment in southern Seoul 
has hit above 200. Meanwhile, the Education Ministry has decided to extend its guideline on the number of students at schools. The guideline was initially expected to end on June 30th. Under the measure that is, primary and middle schools are required to keep the total number of students at school at any given time at one third of the student body, that's the total student body. High schools for their part are allowed to have two thirds. Uh, given the recent sporadic cluster infections and rising imported cases, the ministry has decided to keep this particular quarantine measure for schools intact. Now we are still waiting for that briefing to commence and perhaps while we wait, we can take a look at the uh, guidelines for our everyday quarantine. Now, you are being asked to stay at home for at least three to four days if you are sick. And you are being asked also to stay two arms length away from others. That's called a healthy distance. And if you are apart from each other, healthy, healthily that is, then you are also allowed to take your mask off if you are outdoors. Now, the briefing is about to start now, so we'll come back to you afterwards with our Kwonsoa. First, here is Deputy Director Kwon Junuk with the briefing. 네, Let us now begin our regular briefing for June 25th, Thursday, on the COVID-19 response here in South Korea. As of today, we have 23 local infections and five new imported cases. And 44 more people have been discharged following full recovery, while a total of 1,307 people are in quarantine undergoing treatment. This is a drop by 17 from the day before. However, since the May 27th, this was the first time that we saw a decline in the number of people in quarantine. Here are some of the updates on the regional outbreak here in Korea. At the uh, Seoul uh, Gangnam-gu district in Yeoksam-dong, uh, we also have a club meeting uh, that has has three additional cases and a total of seven have been confirmed to date. This seems to have in relation to uh, the door-to-door uh, -door, uh, -door, uh, business and we are con continuing our chain of transmission and contact testing. Next in Gyeonggi-do, uh, we have Itseon, we have a Kupang Dokpyeong uh, logistics center, we have one uh, employee and one uh, family member being confirmed, so that makes it two confirmed cases. We are conducting epidemiological investigation and testing for 189 contacts. In Daejeon, Seogu district, we have the door-to-door -door business facility. We have 13 uh, more people uh, being confirmed and a total of 71 people have been confirmed to date. We have told you yesterday that related to a car enthusiast club meeting held on uh, held at Yeoido Han River area, we do not have additional cases as of yet. And we have identified that uh, June 12th was the first day of the first uh, identification of the symptoms, and the meeting itself was held on the 15th of June, and we believe that after um, that we com uh, confirmed that uh, these people have had meetings and gatherings at indoor places like bars and restaurants, so we believe uh, that this uh, infection occurred before uh, the outdoor meeting that was held in Han River on 15th of June. So we are conducting investigation on the chains of transmission and contact testing. Here are some of the model cases that have uh, complied with uh, the uh, quarantine measures. This is relation to an in Goyang City, and there was an expo on uh, pets, and uh, this was held uh, last week until uh, 15, 14th of June, and we confirmed that uh, the confirmed case has visited the expo on June 13th. We confirmed that uh, there were uh, good abidance to the quarantine uh, measures and there were no additional cases being confirmed. And in detail, we have identified that people before uh, in entering the venue, they had uh, screening of the body temperature for twice and they had strict uh, sanitization of the hands and they utilized QR codes to manage the visitors. And after the visitors entered uh, the venue, they also prohibited 
all um, consumption of food, including drinking of water. And there was also a manager who was surveilling the area at all times and also called for people to wear their face masks. So we believe that this was a case where um, the people there had abided well to uh, the quarantine measures. And today we have five new imported cases and the countries are as follows. One from Europe and four from Asia, excluding China, two from Pakistan, one from the Philippines and one from India. And in Busan, we have the uh, Russian flagship that has embarked on uh, the 21st of this month, and we conducted uh, the epidemiological investigations, and so far we do not have any additional cases. And yesterday we also told you of the uh, cases of one case uh, who has imported uh, who has an imported cases from uh, China. However, there was an uh, error, and we have reclassified as this person was confirmed to have been coming into South Korea through Iraq. <laughs> and the case DC, we are uh, starting from tomorrow. Uh, we have plans to disclose the clinical and epidemiological data of confirmed cases, and we believe that this is a measure that is effective uh, for us to prepare for another wide search. So we decided that we will be disclosing, disclosing information on 5,500 confirmed cases, and all of these information will uh, be anonymous in order to pr uh, protect their privacy. And also, we will uh, be providing information including age, gender, death, isolation, uh, conditions, uh, severity of the conditions, and their chronic illnesses as well. And we believe that these uh, data and information will uh, be very helpful for the medical uh, staff members who are exerting at the uh, uh, front lines, and they have also been devised by these medical practitioners. So all of the collected information will be released and disclosed uh, on an and um, based on anonymity so that we will be protecting the privacy of these individuals. And they will be given out to the researchers uh, and on a fair uh, system. And we also have a committee that will supervise uh, to which uh, research centers we will disclose these information to. And we have 25 channels in total that can um, receive such information. And we believe that taking this opportunity, we hope that a lot of the experts here at home and abroad could accumulate evidential or scientific data. Last but not least, we are currently developing a, our a plasma treatments and we have 25 additional people who have uh, identified their intentions to uh, donate their plasma samples and a total of 208 people have agreed to do so. So we thank all of you for your support. And last but not least, we have a few messages to the public. Right now, we are witnessing a global pandemic of the COVID-19 and the Director uh, General of the H WHO has said uh, that we are surpassing the 9, uh, mil uh, nine million uh, mark and we are moving to the 10 million mark. And right now, the global countries all around the world are exerting their full efforts to contain the virus even further. And it is very, uh, situation is very fearful because people spread the virus uh, without symptoms. And therefore, uh, the COVID-19 has high infectious rates. And there is no effective cure or vaccine against the virus. And we believe that the immunity uh, level of the co community have been lowered, and we believe that the COVID-19 will be prolonged going forward on a global level. What's more, we believe that um, with effective um, lockdowns, there are many countries that have uh, witnessed a resurgence of the vi virus after they eased their lockdown measures. And in South Korea, for example, we have started from the social distancing with, and we have now moving to a life quarantine measures and we are changing our uh, lifestyle on a uh, principal level and we are also making it a habit to wear our face mask and keep a healthy distance with 
each other. And thanks to the public's uh, participation and support, uh, there are also uh, the uh, um, efforts put forth by the quarantine uh, officials as well as uh, medical uh, practitioners to fight the virus. And we have two following uh, suggestions, first of which is if you have uh, suspicious symptoms, Please uh, go to the clinic, um, clinical centers and get tested as soon as possible because early diagnosis is very important. And we have found that there was a long gap between the first day of uh, symptoms and the final diagnosis. We believe that early testing is very effective uh, in order to curb the virus and to track the contacts as well. And as for the medical centers, we also ask you to suspect COVID-19 if they show similar symptoms. And second, please comply strictly with self-quarantine protocols if you are on mandatory self-quarantine. The quarantine authorities are exerting full efforts to have the situation under control. However, there are many cases uh, where people are breaching these mandatory self-quarantine protocols uh, by going outside or uh, with uh, people coming in to their uh, residential areas. We believe that if these breaches continue, uh, these could become a, a very grave issue for the community as a whole and be a big threat to the society. So uh, again, we ask you to get tested as soon as possible if you have suspected symptoms, and the quarantine authorities will also continue to keep our utmost efforts to curb the uh, further spread of the virus, and we will be continuing to uh, manage and control the system uh, on a great level. Thank you very much very much. Right, that was Kwon Junuk, the Vice Head of KCDC with Thursday's afternoon briefing. Soa, do give us a summary of the key announcements. All right, it looks like cluster infections traced to small gatherings in the metropolitan area are a still a significant factor of concern, especially uh, as we're seeing those really uh, small uh, gatherings. Uh, the one that I just mentioned earlier at uh, Hangang, at the Han River, for instance, uh, where there were car enthusiasts that gathered together. It looks like that case does not have another additional case confirmed. But there is another case in Seoul's Gangnamgu district where a small gathering gathering has now a total of seven new, uh, seven confirmed cases as three were added and it looks like this one is also related to a door-to-door -door, uh, business establishment and uh, speaking of uh, these um, high-risk facilities the Kupang Logistics Center which uh, did not add uh, a lot of new cases in recent days but that one still uh, has rising figures as two more cases were added there and Kwon Junuk, the vice chief of the KCDC mentioned that beginning tomorrow the government will release Release some information on thousands of uh, COVID-19 patients who recovered and uh, will release these information to research centers to prepare uh, for a potential second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, those are the updates. Uh, last but not least, there were also uh, five imported cases, which he mentioned that is quite a decrease from yesterday, but uh, those are scattered uh, from Europe and Asia and uh, from those uh, continents. All right, so thank you for that. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Meanwhile, as mentioned at the start of the program, June 25th marks the anniversary of the cross-border conflict that occurred seven decades ago on the peninsula. In recent days, there's been a roller coaster of events in the region amid Pyongyang's aggressive rhetoric and its subsequent concession of sorts. In this next corner, we connect with our reporter, Chon Song Cho, who is at the Kangwa Peace Observatory, where North Korea can be seen. Hello, Song Cho. Good afternoon, Sunny. Song Cho, it looks quite cloudy there. Right. The weather, uh, to be honest, is not the most ideal weather for some sightseeing because of the drizzles that we've been seeing on and off throughout the day. But uh, surprisingly, actually, despite of the overcast skies, um, the air is very clear, giving us a very good visibility to North Korea. Well, uh, that's what visitors come to the observatory for, because from here you can see North Korea at 
very close range. Well, I mean, Hwanghaedo, the North Korean soil, Hwanghaedo is just 2.2 kilometers away from here. It's so close that it only takes about 10 minutes by car if the two sides were connected by road, of course. So on a clear day, you'll be able to see some civilians and soldiers uh, with the naked eye. But if you want to take a closer look, you might want to use the telescope uh, like the one that you see here. And uh, through this, you might even uh, able to catch glimpses of the normal life of North Koreans. So for instance, I heard that you can even watch North Korean farmers uh, working on the rice paddy. And along the coastline, you'll see soldiers guarding at guard posts. And the atmosphere here is very peaceful and serene, quite a contrast to what we've been hearing from the news. Uh, I'm talking about the escalating tensions between the North and South Korea. Well, you might have already heard the news already, but North Korea um, reinstalled propaganda loudspeakers in 10 different locations across the border region just this Monday. Well, to give you guys some context, well, uh, North the North and South Korea dismantled all of their loudspeakers back in April 2018 after uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met and agreed to end the policy uh, for the Panmunjom Declaration. But two years later, I'm talking about this week, well, in a stunning about phase, North uh, decided to reinstall the loudspeakers in protest of the political uh, leaflets uh, that were sent and flown by North Korean defector groups from South Korea. Well, actually, from here, you can see the loudspeakers that have been set up over there in Kepungung County. Uh, but just yesterday, we heard from North Korea that uh, the North decided to dismantle the loudspeakers again. So we'll have to see, the, uh, see how the relationship unfolds down the road. Well, I'm sure that the last thing on the minds of people from both sides is to see the relations turn sour again and to throw away all the progress that's been made over the past two years because essentially peace is what we all want on the Korean Peninsula, right? So if you come to the observatory, then you can actually go and visit the exhibitions that are, that are in place here. You can learn more in depth about the peace building process of the Korean Peninsula. And actually on the first floor, you can uh, go and and write some memos and pray for reunification as well. Well, I certainly wish that one day I can go that 2.2 kilometers north of the border uh, physically myself. This has been Chun Song-cho reporting live from Kangwa Peace Observatory and back to you guys in the studio. All right, Song-cho, thank you for that report. I was a brain gunner and my regiment was an infantry regiment called the Royal Fusiliers uh, with the City of London Regiment. Uh, the regiment was there from 1952 through to the end of the war. Uh, I joined the regiment in March of 53. Well, I, I went to Korea in 1951, middle of 1951, and uh, I was attached to a unit in Seoul called the Ford Maintenance Area as a dispatch rider. When we went to Korea, we went there, we never heard of Korea. From the British point of view, when we got to Korea and we saw the suffering of the Korean people and the way it had been almost destroyed by the Chinese and the, the North. As far as Korea was concerned, we didn't even know where Korea was. In, 19, in the mid-1950s, um, Korea, with the best will in the world, was a peasant economy. You know, mostly farmers, paddy fields and that sort of thing.
We went back in 2002, my, my wife and I, on the, on the trip organized by the Korean government. And the hospitality and friendship, even the people in the streets would come up and shake hands with us and say thank you for what we did. I said that the, the, the Korean economy in the mid-1950s was a peasant economy, and, that, and I'm not being rude uh, or anything, but that's what it was. And now I think that the, the uh, economy of Korea is, is amongst the, well, one of the four best economies in the world. be quite happy um, to see Korea as two Koreas, provided that everything remains peaceful, um, or as peaceful as it can be. The reunification of the two Koreas is something to be decided by the peoples of South Korea and North Korea, and not by us outsiders. But hopefully that one day you will have a united Korea. In commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, today here in the studio we are poised to touch upon this poignant chapter in history and on the prospects of cross-border ties in modern society. I have Professor Park won -gon from Handong Global University. Welcome back, Professor Park. Thank you for having me. And I also have Professor Paul Tongs from Yonsei University. Good to see you again, Professor Tongs. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Park, perhaps we can start with a few words to commemorate that is on your part, the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Yeah, unfortunately, it means that we passed more than two generations. If we count one generation as 30 years, that means more than two generations still, but we are living under the scars and legacies. We have a, haven't seen any kind of a real permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. And very recently, we are seeing another round of the escalation of tension of the Korean Peninsula. I think at this moment, still the most important issue is North Korea's denuclearization. Without that, we haven't had any chance to see this permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. And also from the uh, academic field, and still Korea is one of the very few places in the world that we are still talking about the origin of the Korean War after the Cold War because of the release of these documents from Soviet Union, mm -hmm. former Soviet Russia and China. It is pretty clear that this Korean War broke out by these three people, that is Kim Il-sung, Mao Zedong, and Stalin, they conspiracy for this break of the war, but still some of the Korean sector are still saying about some kind of revisionist interpretation mm. is based mm. on the like a class struggle. Mm. Right. So one of the legacies. I, I mm. see you share those <laughs> thoughts, Professor Tong. <laughs> yes, as a, as a historian, obviously I'd, I'd agree strongly with Pro Professor um, Park's uh, explanation. I think that's a very coherent one. Perhaps I can also just take a moment. I mean, I appreciate the um, interviews we had with veterans. I just wanted to share a, a story actually, because I had a personal um, connection at, at Yonsei University, one of my new uh, friends and colleagues at our Incheon uh, campus, uh, Professor Thomas Quartermain, and his great uncle actually fought in the Korean War mm -hmm. uh, with the glorious Gloucesters at the uh, very, very uh, important uh, Battle of the Imjin River. And um, his aunt uh, shared with me uh, a, a little brief memo mm. um, about his life. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2007. And so she, she, she wrote, and my late husband, David John Green, wrote the book Captured at the Imjin River. Unfortunately, this hasn't been translated into Korean yet. I'm, I'm sure perhaps some of us would, would be interested in doing that. It's a very moving story of, of an ordinary uh, private soldier, mm -hmm. uh, conscripted national serviceman. Mm -hmm. And uh, as she put it, it's full of stories, sad, happy, and hilarious. He joined the Gloucesters at age 19, met a new friend on the train to the training camp. They became best friends. They arrived in Korea to ferocious fighting. Heartbreakingly, he lost his friend in the battle. He was captured himself. He was marched to a North Korean prisoner of war camp where he spent the next two and a half years, including his 20th and 21st birthdays. As she put it with, I think, characteristic British understatement, uh, this left him with post-traumatic stress disorder, which marred the remainder of his life to some extent. 
So I think our first uh, duty, I'm sure Professor Park will agree with me, is this is a time to commemorate, uh, to show gratitude for the incredible uh, service and sacrifices of those who defended the freedom of the Republic of, of Korea. Um, one of my colleagues who's quite well known, a British uh, journalist here in, in Korea based in Seoul, Andrew Salmon, has written an excellent book that is translated, although I think not currently in print in, in, in Korean. And um, I think it's worth, I think many of our viewers would be interested in reading those kinds of personal mm -hmm. uh, stories, those mm -hmm. testimonies. Often we hear the big numbers, the numbers of casualties and so on, but uh, that's why I'm so pleased to see your, your interviews. I think it's important to remember those very personal stories of the, the heroic uh, sacrifice and uh, the service that was given and is still given. I think we need to pay mm -hmm. um, tremendous uh, gratitude and homage to those serving currently in the mm -hmm. Defense Forces of the Republic of Korea. Uh, those in the United States uh, forces in Korea and the United Nations command. So that's, that was what I'd like to start our program with today. Mm -hmm. Right, of course, those are some very personal sacrifices on their parts. Mm -hmm. Professor Park, mm -hmm. what is the historical significance of the war on the Korean society and perhaps on the history of modern Korea? Well, there are a lot. I mean, well, still, we, many people still are living and they are, have a direct experience of this war. And so in Korean society, still, we are, you know, teaching about this how the war was, you know, very terrible war, mm -hmm. and still we have a very hard feeling against North Korea, especially about this war. And I think the situation is worse in the North. I mean, North they are teaching that this yes. war has been broken out by these Americans and the South Korean puppet, which is uh, totally wrong. Mm -hmm. So unless both South and North Korea come together and they write the textbook and then teach the together for the young generation, I don't think this kind of analysis of is going to be you know, reduced or the, uh, you know, for the stopped for, for a while. And about the, uh, for Korean modern history, for South Korea, we have uh, at least two legacies. You see, in Korean mm -hmm. society, we have uh, anti-communism anti for mm -hmm. the ideology. For, it's been for a very long period of time, since very, uh, until very recently. That is a very dominant ideology for Korean society. And second one is that the alliance with the United States is very important, it's like mm -hmm. vital. And so still many people are saying that it's kind of a very important to have mm -hmm. this alliance with the United States because of this Korean War. Right. Mm -hmm. And Professor, as Professor Parks mentioned, Professor Tongs, the war itself did not just involve the two Koreas on the of peninsula, course. it involved many countries. What impact did the Korean War have on the global front, do you think? Mm -hmm. I think it had a very significant um, impact uh, internationally. Um, it was one of the uh, most important um, full-blown conflict sites of a clash, as Professor Park was saying, between uh, communalis communism and uh, free market uh, democracy. I think the lesson, which I think in many ways that Professor Park correctly said at the beginning, and, and this is something where there is still, uh, if you like, ideological divisions in Korea and, and, and elsewhere, and, but we do know, we know very much that um, you know, Kim Il-sung only attacked with the permission and support of um, Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, with the support also of, of Mao, the People's Republic of China. Mm. I think what it did, I think in, some, some, in, in many ways, um, surprised uh, Stalin and Mao and perhaps um, even Kim Il-sung himself. It showed the resolve of the United States and its allies in the free world um, to resist aggression. That, that the United States and its allies, such as uh, my own country, uh, the United Kingdom, would stand with the Republic of Korea and other countries that were threatened with direct military aggression. I think the, the communist uh, leadership at that time thought that they had great opportunities to expand and pressurize and advance their ideology and, and systems um, globally. And I think it, although there were tremendous um, sacrifices, I think the greatest sacrifices obviously were the civilians and the, the, that great generation of uh, ordinary citizens of the Republic of Korea that we also have to uh, very much commemorate and pay uh, tribute to all the sacrifices they made and the, the, the tremendous um, efforts they made to rebuild um, Korea. But I, I think, as I said, ultimately, if you like, in a nutshell, it prevented World War III. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it was a necessary conflict. Um, often internationally, as you know, one of the cliches, unfortunately, even in places like the United States and U the UK, this has overshadowed the forgotten war. Actually, I think it was a very crucial conflict. Mm -hmm. um, of course, without that military invention, ultimately, frankly, uh, the Republic of Korea would have been annihilated. Um, and I think this is something that really needs to be understood. I think Professor Park made an excellent point as well about education. Um, in my own country, in the UK, it's really only recently, literally this year, 
that the National Historical Association, in partnership with the Career Foundation, is, is teaching, is, is, is teaching in schools. Hopefully they'll use these kind of testimonies that we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, surviving veterans, um, interviews with people both um, in Korea, um, around the world, those many uh, countries that participated militarily, that sent uh, medical aid and other support to the Republic of Korea. I think that this is a time period after um, you know, 70 years, as the Bible says, our lifespan, three score years and 10. I think it's a great turning point, that kind of generational uh, lifetime reflection that it is a tragedy that Korea remains a divided country, as, as, as the British veteran uh, said there, but we need to learn those lessons of history. Mm. Uh, Professor Park, uh, Korea went from, one, uh, from being one of the poorest countries, as mm -hmm. one of the veterans mentioned in the video, yes. uh, to, a very, to a leading country right now. I mean, today, Korea is sharing its COVID-19 strategy. It's uh, exporting its mm -hmm. testing kits as well as testing methods. What do you believe was the driving force behind Korea's ultimate transformation? I mean, South Korea, we have every reason to be very proud because you are right. The Korea is, the, I think, only one country in the world, the history, world modern history that becoming a donor country yes, and correct. get out from the recipient. Right. And we are very proud to join the yes. so-called 30, 50 clubs last year, which means yeah. that we have a, a per capita gross national income more than 30 US, thousand US dollars. And with the 50 million population, we have the seventh member in the world. Mm -hmm. And also we are a member of G20 and also OECD, That's which right. means that we are the, one of the leading countries in the world. I think education is the yes. driving force yes. because right. Korea, we have nothing, especially after the Korean War, destroy everything. We have a little bit industrial base, but it's located in the north, mm -hmm. South, Korea, in the South Korea, there is nothing. But mm -hmm. probably, Paul, you know that yes. Korean parents have a very strong desire to teach, educate their own children with you know, yes. huge you know, kind of cost. They are ready to pay for that. So that's one of the major driving forces to right. develop Korea in this stage. Right. Now, for a broader <laughs> perspective, meanwhile, on cross-border situation at the moment, I have Sue Kim, a policy analyst at Rand Corporation, live on the line. Welcome to the program, Sue. Thanks for having me. Now, Sue, what impact do you believe did the Korean War have on Washington's influence on international affairs and its ties with its global partners? So I, I really appreciated the discussant's um, perspectives on the history and the value of the Korean War. So to me, it's been seven decades, uh, and the, the problem or, or the North Korea problem still persists. To me, that, re that resonates really well because um, it, it reflects the, the status of America, the U.S. interests vis-a-vis um, -vis North Korea, vis-a-vis -vis South Korea, hinges upon how the two Koreas resolve the dispute. And, you know, as, as recent events between North and South Korea indicate, this is a very tough problem that not only implicates education and these very uh, economic disparities between the two countries, but it's also a geopolitical issue. So it's not just about North and South Korea resolving the tensions, but it's also about getting countries like Japan and China and Russia also on board. So there's this complicating factor that seems to get balled up even more into greater tensions and, and greater interests and different stakes. So that's where we are right now. Uh, Sue, our Professor Tongs mentioned this uh, earlier. Why is the Korean War, in your mm -hmm. opinion, referred to as the Forgotten War? Mm -hmm. So it's called the Forgotten War because, um, you know, there hasn't been any mention of the Korean War during and also after the war. And it was squeezed between the Second World War as well as the Vietnam War. So there hasn't really been much of a, I guess, dedication to, to, to the strategic importance of why the two Koreas fought and actually how it was just beyond. Uh, it was not just a regional conflict, but it turned out to be something that's even much bigger. And 70 years later now, today, we see that the North Korean threat um, actually grew a lot. Uh, the, the policies that we've had in both Washington and South Korea and also in other countries, in fact, I think in some ways encouraged and also gave North Korea the, the, uh, the, the confidence and, and the, just the justification for bellicosity. And again, that's a constant reminder that after 70 years, this is a very tough problem and it's getting even tougher because there are other considerations that we have to take, take into play now, which is, you know, for instance, the, the COVID-19 crisis. Mm -hmm. That's also affecting how we negotiate, how we also deal with our allies and partners. So one final question before we let you go. You have heard of North Korea's recent uh, actions here on the peninsula. How do you interpret them? 
Uh, you know, I think it depends on how you interpret uh, the the essence or the importance of the the North Korean nuclear weapons program mm. to the leadership. Uh, I see that the the escalation and then slowly the de-escalation, and now what people call the about face of North Korea as just a part of the the toolkit that North Korea likes to use so that it, it you know holds up in suspension. And then later on, when we're trying to catch up, you know, breathe a sigh of relief, that's where North Korea wants to to actually put us so that we are caught more off guard at, you know, for the next provocation. So to me, I see that the the, the recent provocations and then now the, the, the seeming warming of tensions, I think, is just a foreboding of perhaps even more provocations, maybe not immediately, but somewhere down the road. I see. All right, Sue, thank you for your thoughts and for being with us live at this hour. Thank you. Now, given the time restriction we have, we have simply one question each for professors here. Professor Park, I'll start with you. Very mm. briefly speaking, how would you explain the abrupt shift in stance from uh, Kim Yo-jong's hardline rhetoric to the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un's uh, concession? Mm. I, I lack a better word for that. That's what mm. I'll call it right now, though. What are your thoughts on those? Well, I think it is very difficult, if not impossible, to know exactly what happened in North. But there mm. are, can be a, some kind of speculation. First, I think they are already sending very clear message to the South Korea and also to the United States. And their main purpose is to stop the sending the propaganda leaflet to the North. But our government respond that we are going to make a legislation to prohibit to send that one too. So I think they can reach at least uh, fulfill the, the initial kind of a goal. And second one is that they are doing some kind of cost benefit calculation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are just talking yeah. about the propaganda loudspeaker. I think that's their huge mistake because the loudspeaker is a very uh, you know, vulnerable part of the North Korea. They are very sensitive about this because our the loudspeaker is a very you know, far more efficient and powerful than the North Korea. So we can definitely, I mean, South Korea will have a countermeasure if North Korea installed the loudspeaker and actually they did that, uh, execute that. So that is, uh, they consider that this is time to stop all this kind of, uh, they already mentioned this military behavior and measures. So, so that's why they are trying to stop at this moment. But it's just hold, not the eliminate all the threats mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. Professor Tongs, one final question to you as well. Amid these circumstances, U.S. President Donald Trump has decided to extend for a year sanctions on North Korea. But North Korea is in dire need of assistance. Yes. How can we seek to find a balance between sanctions and humanitarian aid for North Korea? That's a tremendously um, difficult question. Um, I think uh, we, we have a moral dilemma in, in that we need to distinguish between uh, the government of North mm -hmm. Korea Kim regime, the Kim dynasty, and the ordinary people of North Korea. Um, of course, if, if it's possible, uh, one of my uh, close friends and, and, and colleagues, uh, Professor John Francis Kindler, Kinsler, and um, interestingly, his family for several generations were missionaries uh, in North Korea. His father was born in Pyongyang, as many of your viewers might know. Uh, there was a great uh, missionary uh, presence in, in, in the North. Um, I think that there are many uh, charitable and, and NGOs and other organizations that are trying to um, you know, genuinely do, do service, um, especially for the, mo for the most vulnerable people, the disabled, the children, um, those who are, who are really in dire straits. Um, the unfortunate thing from a strategic point of view um, is that in a certain sense, by um, intervening and, and providing humanitarian aid, we take away the responsibility of, of the government. Uh, the regime in North Korea, obviously most governments, whether that's the government of the Republic of Korea or the UK or the US, um, significantly focuses on the uh, health and welfare of right. their citizens. Uh, the North Korean government doesn't have to do so. Um, it focuses purely on regime maintenance. I think it's, it, as, as Professor Park correctly said, it has a strategic calculus. It has played that game successfully for seven decades. It's outlasted many administrations, many different political leaders within uh, the US, the Western community, the Republic of Korea. So it's a tremendously challenging ethical and strategic dilemma for us. We, know, we need to find ways that we can, if you like, guarantee that support is directed at those uh, vulnerable people right. that we have a duty to help. Right. All right, Professor Tongs, thank you very much for your thoughts. And thank Professor you. Park, as always, thank you for being with thank us. You. Right, well, that is all the time we have for today. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at the impact of COVID-19 on the tourism sector, both here and abroad. In the meantime, do reach out to us through our social media accounts or homepage, adidang.com. Thank you for watching.